Liberal leader focuses mainly on economic and social issues. Carrying on the positive mood set by Seoul and Pyongyang during their first high-level talks in two years, hopes are high their military talks, too, will pave the way for greater discussions on reducing tensions. The World Bank inches up this year's global economic growth projection to 3.1 percent, citing positive developments in manufacturing, investment and trade. News Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program. I'm Daniel Che. Let's start things off with President Moon Jae-in's New Year news conference. During the session with the press, he touched on a wide range of issues. As anticipated, questions related to North Korea came flooding in. Our chief Chongade correspondent Moon Gonyoung has this hour's top story. South Korean President Moon Jae-in's first New Year's news conference before some 200 Korean and foreign press televised live across the nation. In a speech that allows the president to outline his government's agenda and national priorities for the rest of the year, the South Korean leader spent most of his time focusing on the nation's economic and social issues. Predictably, however, when the floor was turned over for questions, it was North Korea that took center stage as the president's presser came on the heels of a rare high-level face-to-face between the two Koreas. While describing Pyongyang's Olympic participation as very desirable and that he'll push for even more talks and cooperation with the North, Mr. Moon also made clear that his ultimate goal remains unblurred. The South Korean president had advocated for greater engagement with Pyongyang to reduce tensions, but as leader, he's had to walk a delicate line between the U.S. and North Korea. But on this Wednesday, quelling concerns that the latest overtures by North Korea would drive a wedge between Seoul and Washington, South Korea's commander-in-chief made clear that his government did not differ with the U.S. over how to respond to threats posed by Pyongyang. His warning, North Korea would face stronger sanctions if provocations continued or if it failed to show sincerity in resolving its nuclear issue. Moon gon Arirang News, The Blue House. Staying with the Liberal leader's first presser for 2018, it was also an opportunity to define the direction of the Moon administration's domestic state affairs for the rest of the year as well. Hwang Wojun shares with us his remarks. President Moon is sticking with his pledge to pursue people-centered policies, declaring his goal for 2018 to be protecting ordinary people and improving their quality of life. <laughs> The president pledged to create a peaceful, just, safe and happy society, the sum of which he calls a properly functioning nation. He said he will continue structural reforms for a fair economy and boost the number of quality jobs, primarily focusing on employment for the younger generation by making the issue a national agenda. The liberal leader emphasized the importance of raising the minimum wage as a way of stimulating growth led by rising incomes, which guarantees quality of life for low-wage workers. He did acknowledge that raising the minimum wage might have the side effect of forcing some marginal businesses to shed employees, but asserted that in the long run, it will increase jobs and revitalize the economy. President Moon also stressed that the nation will soon see its gross national income per capita surpass 30,000 U.S. dollars and introduce some key policies so that the people can, in fact, enjoy their economic success. 
These include reinforcing health insurance coverage, bringing down interest rates on loans and fees for credit cards, increasing the basic pension for the elderly, and helping with the burden of childcare by giving parents a monthly allowance of about 93 U.S. dollars for each child under the age of five. Also getting a lot of attention Wednesday was the issue of revising the Constitution. President Moon said the Constitution, last revised 30 years ago, is no longer up to the task of upholding the thoughts and rights of the people today. He called on the National Assembly to reach agreement soon and reiterated his determination to hold a national referendum concurrently with local elections scheduled for June. Uh, some parties have called for a vote on the constitution to be held separate from the local elections, but the president rejected that, noting it would cost an additional 112 million U.S. dollars. According to the latest poll, President Moon's approval rating is above 70 percent going into the new year. He'll be looking to keep that level of support when it comes to domestic issues as well, to prove his people-centered policies are not just empty promises. Hwang Ho-jun, Arirang News. President Moon also addressed the issue of Japan's wartime sex slavery during the event. Regardless of how the decision could affect bilateral ties, he reiterated Seoul will not be seeking renegotiation of the 2015 deal, describing it as defective and also called on Tokyo to apologize. Kwon Jang-ho follows us this report. President Moon was asked about whether he was satisfied with the follow-up measures to deal with the controversial 2015 Seoul-Tokyo agreement on the issue of Japanese wartime sex slavery. This is how he answered. That solution announced on Tuesday is to discredit the agreement, saying it is fundamentally flawed, but not seek to renegotiate or dissolve it. Seoul also said Japan needs to voluntarily offer a sincere apology to the victims, which President Moon also reiterated. It's a response that has received a mixed reaction from those in Korea, with some understanding the need to maintain ties with an important regional partner, but seeing the move as doing little for the victims themselves. A sincere apology. It's hard to define what that exactly constitutes. And the Moon administration have said they will continue listening to the victims. But when the 2015 deal was reached, there were 47 registered survivors. Now there are only 31. There's not much time to have their voices heard. Meanwhile, Tokyo's initial reaction has been strongly negative, saying Seoul must honor the deal and that an official complaint will be made. And in response to Seoul's calls for an apology, those in Japan will point to the deal as a form of official apology. But there is an argument that Tokyo has not on the deal either, with several senior officials denying the atrocity, most notably at a hearing of women's rights issues at the UN in 2016. Tokyo must also consider the need for good relations with Korea, especially with issues such as the North Korean threat in the region. The 2015 deal was one Prime Minister Abe actively pursued, and if it were to be broken or renegotiated, it would do a great deal to his political image at home. But there are many areas where he needs to maintain relations with Seoul, so despite strong words, he is unlikely to take strong action. Snubbing Seoul's invite to Pyeongchang 2018, though, remains likely. With both countries understanding the importance of their partnership, a total breakdown of the bilateral relationship is not expected. But tensions will remain, and for the victims, the comfort women issue, which the deal said had been resolved in 2015, is definitely not over. Kwon Jang-ho, Arirang News. Moon Jae-in has clearly set himself apart from previous leaders of this nation in a variety of ways leading up to this point of his relatively young presidency. Kim Min-ji explains how he further raised the bar in that respect through his brand of open and candid press conference. 
The New Year's press conference was held in a freestyle manner, with neither questions nor questioners chosen in advance. Journalists had to try and make eye contact with the president to get his attention. And although the press conference was non-scripted, President Moon was readily able to respond to the questions. We could say it was the most successful freestyle press conference we've seen in Korean history. Although journalists' questions were more focused on pending issues rather than in the order of subjects set by the Blue House, it was an opportunity for journalists to ask things they're really concerned about. The president's 20-minute speech and hour-long Q&A session was used to expound on his vision for boosting the quality of people's lives and also touched upon some difficult and heavy issues, such as the 2015 deal between South Korea and Japan on the sex slave issue, as well as a North Korea nuclear issue. On the agreement with Tokyo, it was an occasion for the president to talk about his stance, making very clear that the deal is not satisfactory and saying the Korean government will do its utmost to restore the victim's dignity. The president's position of using South Korea's own finances to heal the wounds of the victims seems as though he's sending a message to Japan that it should be ashamed of its wrongdoings and the fact they aren't taking full responsibility. It's more of an ethical approach than a diplomatic one. On North Korea, President Moon vowed to stick with a two-track approach, continuing to support dialogue, but at the same time pressuring the regime with sanctions until it takes a path of denuclearization. Experts say unlike his predecessors who had somewhat far-fetched goals, such as unification, the aim during his term is to maintain peace on the peninsula. They also pointed out that the president is doing a good job juggling Washington and Pyongyang. Uh, president Moon is now pursuing North-South Korea relations and U.S.-South Korea alliance altogether simultaneously. I mean, previously, conservative or progressive governments only focused on either of these two things, but he's trying to minimize the risks of any kinds of diplomatic loopholes that we can expect from any diplomatic relationship with any other kinds of uh, countries. So I think his balanced way of pursuing the relationship with the United States and with North Korea, I think, is very desirable portions of our diplomacy. The general consensus among experts is that the president had a lot on his plate during the past eight months, with a string of international summits, the fallout from the deal with Japan, North Korea's continued provocations and constitutional revision, which sometimes overshadowed important issues like people's livelihoods. In the second year of his term, experts say he needs to allow enough time and attention for all these issues. And they say reporters should ask bolder and more in-depth questions that the Korean people are curious about, especially in such an open setting with a president who is comfortable communicating and sharing his ideas. Kim min Arirang News. Pyongyang confirming its participation in the Winter Olympics during the high-level talks signal they thaw in inter-Korean relations. At this point, expectations of more constructive developments are very high. However, according to our Jim Young-gil, it's going to be a long and tough process. South and North Korea have agreed to hold further high-level talks, working-level talks and military talks in the upcoming days. But the dates have not been set. The reason why we did not fix the date for the talks is because we have the communication channel opened at Panmunjom. The dates for the upcoming talks will be set for further negotiations. The two sides will hold working level talks in order to have a North Korean delegation conduct an on site survey of the Olympic facilities in Pyeongchang prior to the arrival of the athletes. The exact dates of such visit will be fixed through exchanging documents. But Tuesday's talks weren't completely harmonious as North Korea's chief negotiator Lee Sun Gwan expressed strong discontent over South Korean claims to the media that denuclearization could be part of upcoming South North military talks. Therefore, Seoul's unification ministry said denuclearization was a process towards peace on the Korean peninsula. We cannot make concessions over the South North's joint declaration to achieve denuclearization on the Korean peninsula. We are trying our best to peacefully resolve the North's nuclear issue. 
The North chief negotiator Li stressed during the talks that all the North strategic weapons, including atomic and hydrogen bombs, ICBMs, and rockets, were entirely targeting the United States. He said Pyongyang is not targeting South Korea nor China or Russia. Seoul hopes to promptly resume dialogue on a peace settlement, which would include denuclearization. However, no headway was made toward organizing another round of reunifications for families separated during the Korean War, nor toward the possibility of reopening the shut-down Kaesong Industrial Complex. Kim young Arirang News. The two Koreas restored both communication lines at the border village of Panmunjom and at the West Sea area. The big question now, when and how Seoul and Pyongyang will hold their long overdue military talks. Oh jung has more details on the move expected to greatly lower the tension on the peninsula. Communication channels between the two Koreas are being restored as the apparent thaw in relations continues. The two Koreas' Western military communication line is now back open, complementing the inter-Korean hotline at the Truce village of Panmunjom restored just last week. The Western line became fully operational Wednesday morning after Seoul and Pyongyang conducted a brief maintenance check. It was almost two years that Pyongyang disconnected them in February 2016 in protest against Seoul's shutdown of the jointly run Kaesong Industrial Complex. South Korea and North Korea will be able to talk about various military issues through this channel, which will help greatly in preventing clashes at the inter-Korean sea or land border. The fact that Pyongyang has restored this line means it's willing to keep its relations with Seoul. This line will also become the main channel through which the military authorities of Seoul and Pyongyang fine-tune the specifics of the military talks they agreed to on Tuesday. Neither the schedule nor the agenda of the talks is yet known, but South Korea's defense ministry says the top priority is the successful and peaceful hosting of the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Then the two sides may be able to touch upon other security issues, which might even stretch to cover Seoul's anti-Pyongyang loudspeaker broadcast at the border. The talks are likely to be on a working level, where Seoul and Pyongyang discuss the method and safety measures to be used for the North Korean athletes and delegation to walk to the south through the demilitarized zone. Experts think Pyongyang could eventually demand that Seoul suspend its joint military drills with Washington and scrap the deployment of U.S. strategic assets, but not immediately. If held within this month, the military talks would be the first in over three years since October 2014. Oh Jung-hee, News. Let's now shift our focus to a different story. The World Bank raised the 2018 growth forecast to 3.1 percent. However, there are still high uncertainty surrounding these prospects. Cha sang helps us look beyond the digits. The World Bank on Tuesday projected the global economy to grow by 3.1 percent in 2018, with growth slowing down slightly in 2019 and 2020. The figure is 0.2 percent higher than the World Bank's forecast from last June. The institution attributed the rise to recovery in investment and manufacturing and a continuation of trade. In its Global Economic Prospects report, the World Bank forecast this year to be the first that the world economy is operating at full capacity since the financial crisis a decade ago. The report wrote that the major economies, the United States, Eurozone and Japan, are expected to see moderate growth of around 2.2 percent this year as central banks gradually remove their post-crisis stimulus measures. Growth in the emerging and developing economies will rise to 4.5 percent in 2018 with strong commodity exports. The institution said uncertainty around global growth prospects still remains high, despite the possibility of stronger-than-expected growth in large economies. The institution advised advanced economies to continue to reinforce financial regulations and supervision, and emerging and developing economies to strengthen policy frameworks to ensure financial stability. As for Korea, experts say its economic outlook isn't as bright as that of other nations. Experts predict Korea's economy to grow by 2.8 percent this year, a bit lower than the projected global economic growth average and down from last year's growth rate. The reasons are domestic, 
such as an increase in corporate income tax, excessive pay rises, and commercial law amendments. The World Bank publishes economic prospects reports every January and June. Cha Sangmi, Arirang News. IT, peace, and of course, culture. In tune with the central theme of the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Games, a special set of commemorative items are unveiled. Wang Zhonghuan shows us how the organizing committee and many other dedicated individuals are putting the final touches to add to the festive mood. The organizers of the Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympic Games have showcased a new set of commemorative coins and banknotes to the public for the first time in Seoul on Wednesday. Last year, 11 kinds of commemorative coins were released at the first sale and 12 kinds at the second sale. This time, we have put all of them together, as well as the commemorative banknotes inside the 888 limited edition set to commemorate the upcoming 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. This special set of commemorative coins and banknotes consist of four gold, 15 silver and two bronze coins, along with three kinds of banknote. Just 888 sets have been made. This number comes from combining 88 from the 1988 Seoul Olympics and 8 from Pyeongchang 2018. The set costs just over 10,000 US dollars. The first customer to purchase the set of special coins and banknotes was Korean R&B singer In Sunhee, who is an honorary ambassador for the Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Games and the singer of the Pyeongchang theme song, Let Everyone Shine. In Sunhee's personal name was also engraved on her commemorative set. And those who purchase a set can also have their name engraved on their set and will also have their name written on the plaque at the 2018 Pyeongchang Memorial Hall. The special set of commemorative coins and banknotes will be available to pre-order from the 15th to the 26th of this month from major banks and post offices or online at the Pungsan Hwadong website. Meanwhile, as the two Koreas agreed on Tuesday that the North will send a delegation to the next month's Winter Olympics, the organizing committee expects the occasion to be a rare chance for inter-Korean exchanges. Although we are highly confident of pursuing a cultural Olympics and IT Olympics, previously we had some concerns about a peaceful Olympics for Pyeongchang 2018. But now that North Korea has decided to participate, we are very confident that we can achieve the Peace Olympics as well. South Korea hopes that the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics could set the tone for bringing peace to the divided peninsula. Won Jong-un, Arirang News. Forces of nature let their presence clearly be felt in the southern region of the nation. Heavy snowfall and strong winds grounded flights and clogged roads. Making matters worse, the mercury is expected to dip even further down in the next couple of days. Park hye tells us more. Intense winter weather caused havoc Wednesday in the southern regions of Korea, snarling traffic on the roads and at the airports. The southern island of Jeju was one of the worst hits. A heavy snowfall alert was issued for the entire island as of 7 p.m. Wednesday. More snow is expected to fall until Friday, with some mountainous areas likely to be blanketed with up to 50 centimeters of snow. Fierce winds caused chaos at Jeju International Airport for a second day. The strong wind and wind shear warnings issued for all arriving and departing flights in southern cities, including Gwangju and Yeosu, led to dozens of delays and cancellations. As of 5 p.m. local time, 86 flights to and from those cities were delayed and 28 canceled. Meanwhile, heavy snowfall and strong winds forced the authorities to completely close off Jeju's highest peak, Mount Halasan, and most roads along the island's coast. Service was suspended on all passenger ships as well. In Jeollanando province, where strong wind and heavy snow warnings were issued, a series of car accidents have also occurred continuously, particularly in Gwangju and Suncheon. Although there are no deaths, dozens were injured and taken to the hospital. Further damage is expected on Thursday due to snowfall continuing until the next morning. Seoul has seen only light snow in the morning, but the cold has some roads and sidewalks frozen. Temperatures are forecast to drop even more on Thursday, likely making for the coldest day so far this season. Park Kijun, Arirang News. Time now to turn to Michelle Bach at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, it looks like we'll have to bundle up or stay home. More and more regions are under cold wave alerts. 
That's right, Daniel. Now, currently, Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, Chungcheong-buk-do, and Gyeongsang-buk-do provinces have been issued with cold wave warnings, leaving the remaining southern regions with advisories. In short, practically the whole country is under a cold wave alert. Chungcheong-nam-do and Jeollado provinces, in addition, have been heavy snow warnings in place. Until Friday, Jeollado provinces are expected to get more than 15 centimeters of snow, while mountainous regions over in Jeju and Dokdo Island will get up to 50 centimeters of snowfall. Looking at tomorrow's readings, Seoul will wake up to minus 13 degrees Celsius, while Daegu and Busan are looking colder than usual at minus 9 and minus 6 degrees, respectively. Even into the day, Seoul will barely reach up to minus 8 degrees, while Gwangju and Busan hitting up to minus 2 and 1 degrees. This cold spell will weaken over the weekend, leading us right into milder conditions by next week. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That's all we have for you at this hour from all of us here at Adirang News. Thank you for watching.